And I'm also going to hit live transcription. So if you do not want to see that on your end, you can turn it off um, if that's distracting for you. Um, and we will share the recording on our YouTube channel um, later today, probably um, this afternoon sometime. So I want to welcome all of you for joining us. Um, and I want to introduce our two panelists for us to get started on this discussion on housing equity. Um, so first we have Carrie Acevedo. She served as the executive director of the Rockford Area Habitat for Humanity for almost eight years. I hope I have that right, Carrie. I was yeah. surfing your LinkedIn profile. So. <laughs> um, she came to Habitat after working for several years in development, passionate about helping families build strength, stability, and self-reliance through home ownership, and became a homeowner during all this crazy pandemic also. Um, and she earned her bachelor's degree from Western Illinois University. Um, Kimberly Richardson, the Deputy City Manager for the City of Evanston for the last three years and then assistant to the City Manager for six years prior to that. And she has a little bit of employment news, so she'll share that with us also. Um, she's worked for several municipalities, including the Village of Flossmoor, Riverside, Rockford, and Bensonville. So you guys have a Rockford connection there too. Yeah. Um, and she earned her bachelor's degree and MPA from NIU. And I asked Kimberly and, and Carrie, um, to join me in this discussion. So these these real talk series is really about finding a topic that I think is is salient that people are interested in. There's not a presentation. There's no it's not a formal thing. It's really a conversation to just get some insight around a particular topic. And this notion of housing equity has um, has been on my mind for a little while, which is why I put this uh, together. And it popped up because Kimberly's doing some real fun stuff in, in Evanston that she's going to talk about. Um, but also during COVID, housing has been so critical for us <laughs> as our safe place we're supposed to retreat to, um, to be able to work, live, sleep, do school, do work, all of that stuff within the confines of some kind of housing for those of us who are housed, <laughs> um, that we're, it really is supposed to be that place. And it's not for everyone. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not available to everyone for lots of different reasons. Um, I was just listening to something the other day, people are, you know, they worked on their backyards the first summer of the pandemic, everybody was doing that stuff and converting garages into offices and all that kind of stuff. Like definitely on the privileged level that you have the space to be able to do those things. Um, so that, that kind of said, well, what we need to have really is this broader discussion of what do we, what do we mean by housing equity? Is it, is it really that everyone has the right to housing and what does that look like? and what kind of housing and what does that look like? Um, so in my personal history, I come from a family of renters, um, single mom and and we rented every uh, growing up everywhere and the lots of different housing options. We moved whenever rent went up, we moved somewhere else. <laughs> so we moved around a lot. Um, and so home ownership was relatively new to me as well. Um, so when I think about housing equity, you know, there's lots of different avenues and I think um, I'm gonna lean on uh, the my participants today to kind of think through what is what does housing equity mean to you in the context of your work so Kimberly in relation to local government and, and Carrie on your side um, working in uh, in a nonprofit organization in collaboration of course with uh, local governments so Kim I don't know if you want to you want to kick that off and then uh, we'll just go bat it around back and forth as we go thank you um uh, first thank you again for inviting me to this conversation I was kind of like taking it back. I was like, oh, wow, you want me to talk about housing? Okay, I think I can do this. Um, and I can because I'm very fortunate to work in an organization such as the city of Evanston that uh, we are we run our housing grant program internally. So uh, not only do we deal with CDBG funding, we also are looking at uh, other avenues of funds. We work a lot with our non-for-profit organization, Connections with the Homeless, is a large organization that we work with. Um, we also work with an organization called SEPA, uh, which is out of Lake County, uh, which is Community Partners for How Affordable Housing, um, Center for Independent Futures, uh, Interfaith Action. So a, a plethora of organizations. I tell people in Evanston, you hit a rock, you hit a non profit. Uh, I think we have probably more non profits in, in our little eight, eight square miles. But with that, it also has some benefits because we are able to respond pretty quickly when we deal with some forms of housing insecurities. And so the pandemic occurred uh, immediately. We were able to make some adjustments to our, our, uh, our ordinances to allow for housing of homeless 
into our, our um, hotel spaces, um, as well as getting ability to help support our organizations that house the homeless, and then really um, relaxing our emergency uh, funds for housing to allow for folks to be able to apply uh, before they're getting to that point of where eviction was a reality. And so we are very, I say, privileged in Evanston because we have these plethora of, of, of resources being that we are a full service organization, but we also have a systemic issue in that we will, we will say that the city sits on a very uh, diverse range of eco social economics in Evanston. We have the missing middle, which is about, I would say, 30%. Uh, uh, then we have those who are our higher end, who are what you consider North Shore. You think of this part of our population, that homes are ranging from a million to five plus million dollars. And then you have our working community members who are able to afford housing, but uh, are not considered, but are considered that the majority of their housing expenses uh, does outpace their earnings. And then you have those who are not able to, are, are what we call housing insecure. Uh, so we have that plethora of, of community members that support our city. And so um, we really try to look at ways to partner with organizations. Uh, Open Communities is one that we partner with to help with rental assistance and others as we can. Um, and so we also are looking at our ordinances and so forth. Um, we have, I'm going into a deep dive, but I just want to just share with you all just the resources that's happening in Evanston. So we have an exclusionary a housing ordinance uh, that we have, that's been in implementation over a decade. We've made some modifications to it, and we're beginning to see now more of our new housing are able to, are now actually building the homes uh, or the units within their uh, development before, it was cheaper just to get the lieu of and just pay that uh, in lieu. And now we're seeing them building homes. However, the problem that we're still facing is that those homes are not actually suitable for whole, uh, families of four. They're usually single family, uh, excuse me, single op occupancy or two, per or two person household. And so we're still missing that four ability uh, as it relates to families that are four plus. And so now we're looking at um, ADUs as an op opportunity. We've, we began that process of, of approving uh, a accessory dwellings such as coach houses, tiny homes, and other little options that we are looking at, uh, which has come with some pushback um, in certain parts of the community. Guess, guess what part of the community would have pushback? Who might have coach homes? Um, and so we're trying to figure it all out. At the same time, we have a community that is pushing us. Uh, affordable housing is something that you have to realize we are sitting on very valuable land. We are yeah. landlocked. So you can only build up. And so with that, you know, the city of Evanston, our, our property value is high. Our, our taxes are high. The land is expensive. So it's hard even when you have builders to come in who have a good intention they're not able to build capacity because it's just costly. And so, um, especially now with what's going on as it relates to the um, inflation cost of c construction, mm -hmm. that, that, that dovetails into affordable housing as well. And so we're dealing with all these different challenges and how we can be able to um, bridge that gap. It's, it's gonna be difficult for a, a community our size where we're geographically located, and just the um, the socioeconomics of the city. That was my introduction. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's great. I'm taking notes because we'll come back to a lot of the stuff that that you had mentioned. <laughs> so, so Carrie, how does yeah. housing equity relate to Habitat? And then, what have you guys done in this space? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, Dr. Shadowman, for having me today. <laughs> Uh, anybody who knows me knows that I could talk for days about housing and, and housing equity and uh, what we what we need to do as a society to ensure that everyone, uh, and gosh, do I mean everyone, have a safe, affordable place to live. You know, Habitat for Humanity is kind of grounded in this idea, right, that housing is a human right. 
Um, lots of people can argue with me about that for days, but at the end of the day, every single person, uh, no matter where you live, no matter who you are, no matter how much money you make and what you do for a living, deserves a safe place to, to lay their head at night. Habitat's been working in that arena as it relates to home ownership. So, you know, everybody, you know, who's um, bought a house before knows what equity is, right? It's this idea that that's the piece of the puzzle that you own, right? And so if you buy a house for $100,000 and over years you pay down your loan and your house increases in value, you own the difference between what it's worth and what you owe. Where else can you say that, right? That an asset becomes, right, um, in increases in value. You buy a car, it immediately depreciates, um, right? Most every other commodity that you purchase depreciates in value, whereas housing appreciates in value. And so for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, if you were not in a position to be able to purchase your own home, you couldn't build that financial wealth. And so Habitat for Humanity believes in those two core principles. Everybody deserves a safe place to sleep at night and um, everybody deserves an opportunity at home ownership. Home ownership has a significant amount of benefits, right? Not, not just financially, but it ensures success educationally for kids who live in a stable environment. It allows for um, better health outcomes, right? We could talk for days about the kinds of health outcomes that come from families who rent apartments that are full of black mold or who live, you know, in really tough neighborhoods. So it doesn't just impact your socioeconomic status, it impacts your education and it impacts your health. And, and we all know that in order to be, you know, productive citizens and to give back to our communities, right, um, education matters and health matters. The thing that's really cool about housing equity is that it's solvable. It's a solvable problem. We just, we are, you know, there's lots of organizations. The city of Evanston is doing such great things. Organizations like Habitat for Humanity realize that everybody deserves that, right? Like everybody deserves that kind of hand up. When you think about generationally, how many families have purchased homes and been able to pass that wealth down, you know, to their, to their descendants, there's a gap. There's a huge racial wealth gap. And a lot of that has to do with housing. Our government put redlining in place for a reason. And there are, you know, thousands and thousands of families who were never afforded an opportunity to purchase an asset, a home, a safe place that appreciates in value if done properly. Um, right over time. And so we do, Habitat for Humanity kind of functions in two ways as it relates to kind of, to, you know, filling that racial wealth gap is that we provide mortgages to families who don't qualify anywhere else. So at the core of who we are and what we do, we serve a population of people who banks won't serve. And so we look at their credit scores and we look at their history and we look at their income and we're like, Okay, so you wouldn't normally qualify for a conventional mortgage, but through a program like Habitat, we're able to qualify families for mortgages and give them this opportunity at stability. The second thing we do, and maybe more importantly, is who we, you know, um, who we offer our program to is how we set you up for success. Once you're in a Habitat for Humanity program, we ensure that your mortgage is affordable. And we do that by making your mortgage payment <laughs> what you can afford. So Habitat will build, say, a house that's, you know, maybe costs us $200,000 to develop because oh, we all know um, cost of construction materials has been real ugly for the last 22 months. But what we do is we, we don't care about the gap, we're not trying to make our money back. We're trying to ensure the family who purchases the home can afford it. And so we create an affordable mortgage for them. So it's a 0% interest mortgage. Again, where do you find that kind of program? And we look at 30% of their monthly gross income. So we never let them pay more than say 20, 25% of their monthly income on their mortgage. So say we 
you know, a house appraises for 200,000 and what they can afford to pay Habitat back is 80, guess what? That's what they pay us back. And so we are qualifying families that wouldn't normally qualify and we're providing them an opportunity to be successful by ensuring that they have a manageable mortgage payment. At the end of the day, guess who owns that equity? They do. And so we're building significant financial um, you know, success and equity in their home so that they can then continue to pay that forward. It's a slow process, right? I mean, lots of people of color have been excluded from the opportunity and home ownership for so many years. But in, commu you know, in 1400 communities across the United States, Habitat for Humanity is focused on that idea that everybody deserves that right to purchase their own home and to, you know, to have that stability both financially and health-wise and educationally and, you know, emotionally, um, that housing is such an important factor in, you know, every aspect of a person's life. When we went into the shelter in place last spring after, you know, COVID first hit, it's an interesting conversation to have, you know, with people who don't have a safe place to go, who can't, you know, their, their kids went to school to be safe. Their kids went to school to, you know, have warmth and to have food. Um, they went to work, right? And then their home then became both their workspace and their kid's classroom and, 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 right? It became doctor's offices and, right? We started to do everything within the confines of our home. And that's very privileged for so many of us that we can convert spaces in our homes for offices and classrooms. And, you know, there's a significant number of people who can't. And so we believe in this idea that everybody deserves housing equity, that everybody deserves that right. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> and I know we've had good conversations about yeah. this and you could definitely talk more about it. Um, you know, Kim, I'm curious in the work that you do as a municipality, can you give an example of some work that you've done um, through collaboration with some of the with some of the nonprofits or other government entities? And what does that look like in Evanston? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Let me. There you go. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. So I'm just going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I was going to, what I was saying is that, uh, yes, I think it's key that we have those partnerships, um, and we do have those. I'll use, for example, the housing situation that occurred as as part of a stay at home order. And as I mentioned, uh, as it relates to those individuals that were housing insecure, uh, you know, it was the community that was very much concerned. If you remember the time of year that this all occurred was at the tail end of winter, and we were still under a situation where it was cold, and our, our, our community pantries had closed because those have, are mostly managed by senior populations who were the most vulnerable at the time. Uh, that also includes some of our emergency shelters uh, that had to close because that too was being um, uh, volunteered and staffed by seniors. And so we had to kind of come together and we created a task force that we put together with a number of our housing community uh, partners and one, we found, like I said, we decided the city, uh, we found that this was going to be a reimbursable expense. So we did um, work with our community partners, Connected for the Homeless, to place those individuals who we could not place in a, a shelter into a, a housing um, uh, room in, in a hotel that had closed due to COVID. And one thing that we did, it was kind of, it was still a wraparound services. So they had their uh, caseworker, uh, and then eventually, at some point, uh, we were able to move a number of those individuals into some form of permanent housing over the course of the year and a half. And so uh, I think we still may have a little bit over 20 people that are still housed uh, in a hotel. A number of those houses are, um, I know those houses are, um, a number of those houses 
um, are, um, you know, still in our school systems and so forth. And also, um, I'm getting a text from someone I see who's on the call. Uh, the person who should probably be on this call, Sarah, our grant housing, housing manager, she just said um, our ETHS uh, um, geometry and, and construction project, well, I'll get to in a, in a minute, but uh, we, we have, um, you know, we really recognize that in a time of need, we needed to act quickly and responsibly, and, and that was really outside the norm because that's not what government does. Uh, we leave that really typically to the non for profits uh, We will funnel funds to them, but we usually are not the ones that are setting up the contracts and making sure that we are paying the bills. That's just not something local government do. And I think what we realized because of the pandemic, uh, that is something that we can do and, and, and we should do as we uh, partner and find resources that will help those organizations. And, and then, you know, as, as Sarah has mentioned, um, we have a high school, our high school, Evanston Township High School. It's probably one of, I mean, if you go to that high school, it's probably as large as the Northwest, North, uh, Northern Illinois campus. It's a large campus and has a, a ton of resources. And one of them is through a program called ETHS um, Geometry and Construction. And uh, this is where high school students build a house. Um, and we work with our community partner, uh, CEPA, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we do have those who are eligible via income eligibility. Uh, we then have that enter into uh, some form of a land trust that's maintained as a permanent affordable uh, housing for that. So when that individual does decide to sell, it's still an affordable housing unit. Uh, the question, though, that we're trying to, um, to answer is that we then get into the conversation that was said earlier by Carrie, those houses are in areas that are where a concentration of our community members that are not um, with them, uh, who cannot meet the 30% at times. So how do we move those same type of programs outside of those areas? Because what we're doing is we're concentrating those individuals socioeconomically in the same areas that, you know, people socioeconomically are challenged are in. And so we still have that separation um, within our community. And so, but land is expensive. And we realize that if you go further north, that land is not going to be as affordable as you are uh, west and south. Uh, but then talking to Carrie about the conversation about disparity when it comes to home ownership, that dovetails into why we are doing our reparations program here in Evanston. I will tell you, it sounds better now than what it sounded when we initially started. <laughs> um, it was a, a conversation, and I think that our senior population really were the ones that voiced that they were seeing their family. Um, I want to just acknowledge in Evanston something that I hadn't seen growing up on the south side of Chicago and growing up in the south suburbs as well. There is a generational, um, generational black families live in Evanston. So when I say generational, I don't mean just one or two. I mean going back to when the city was founded. And there is a pride in that, uh, having lived in Evanston and continue to have a family uh, generational home. But what we saw, especially at the beginning of the, at the turn when the economy uh, crashed with the housing market, a number, of those, a number of those individuals lost their home either due to refinancing. So let's say when the market was hot, so a family member would take out um, equity in the home and now the market has crashed and no longer can afford it and lost their home. Also, you have taxes. As I said, in Evanston, our taxes is, is no joke. Um, it is very high. I mean, and it's definitely, um, you know, it's due to our school system. Um, and so you begin to see a, de a, a increase of black Evanstonians leaving uh, the city. And that caused some concern, especially with one of our then aldermen, uh, who wanted to do something about keeping and expanding black wealth in housing. And so that was the impetus for how we began the conversation. And with the help of my colleague, Sarah, uh, you know, we really, she, knowing CDBG very well and census tracts, 
was able to show me overlaying the census tract with redlining map, and it was pretty much in line with what redlining happened way back when, uh, when we were looking at segregation of our community. And you look at the census tract, and you would see a parallel with that. And so that was really a good study. And one other thing, a number of our black community members did not live in the west part of Evanston. They were relocated there. And so either by Northwestern or by the city or by other means. And so you start to see a concentration of our black Evansonians are living in areas where the soil is not the greatest, the, you know, the conditions, infrastructure, and so forth. And then you have on top of that this disparity with, with when it comes to um, the economic disparity. And so over time, you saw generations lose their homes or become house poor, or you begin to see dilapidation in the home of people who are not able to maintain their housing. And so we look at the reparations program as a way to begin to address it. It doesn't wholly address, but it's a step in the direction of addressing. And so uh, we are hopeful that as we start dispersing the funds in the coming months, that we will begin to see some form of repair, even if it's just uh, the first 16 as it is at this moment, uh, we'll begin to see some stabilization in those homes, those individual homes, as they're able to think, just think about this. And I was having this conversation a few years ago and never really connecting the dots into more recently. When I asked the community development department, like where are the areas that you get the most permits, like requests for permits for expansion of homes or remodeling or roofs or things of that nature, you can map it out. And the majority of those costs were coming north and east of the city. And what we were seeing, and I said, well, there's people on the West End, but there was, but think of how much it costs to remodel a kitchen, to do any type of repair to your home that is not just a life safety repair. These are things that are, one, you can, if you have the means to pad a pocket, you can, but a lot of it requires financing. And one thing we do know is that there, still to this day, when it comes to financing to individuals of color, uh, there is still some discriminatory practices. I mean, it may not be as, um, as, as, as overt as it used to be, but it's built into the credit score. It's built into what you're, what you're borrowing and you know, your loans. And you know, some people have to take out a, a similar to a payday loan because of, of uh, a, 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 a bank institution may not actually finance them for $5,000. So they have these predatory loans. Like all these things are factors because there's no wealth. People are not building wealth in their homes. And so hopefully through this program, we are allowing individuals to build wealth that may not have been built because they're just trying to sustain a house. And they're trying to just keep a roof over their hands, over their heads. And so this is just a step. It's not, you know, it's not perfect. It's not going to change overnight Evanston's trajectory within the Black community, but it hopefully begins to stabilize those who are still in the community uh, who may not be able to stay within the next 10 years when the census is redrawn, uh, the census is back up again. So, um, yeah, that's what I have to share at this point. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, Carrie, Moving yeah. a little west of there, yep. what's that picture look like in Rockford? Different community completely, but what does it look like? Yeah, in terms of partners. Yeah, in terms of partners and then some things that you've done to yeah. uh, address what does housing look like for Rockford? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, surprisingly enough, much like a community like Evanston, communities like DeKalb, communities across the state of Illinois, there's great wealth and there's great poverty, right? And so, and there's kind of everything in between. When we think about housing, you know, I I know Alicia, we and I talk, you and I talked about this on your podcast about this continuum of mm -hmm. housing, right? Everything from homeless services, including like actual shelters where people you know, sleep at night all the way up to the most expensive home in your community, everybody fits on that con continuum somewhere, right? Like the person who owns the, the most expensive house in the community still has to afford that home. 
And so what we do is we play this kind of role on this continuum and we work with families who have housing insecurity, have a history of housing disparity, and then provide them an opportunity, right, to kind of create a gateway, to create a bridge to, you know, what we refer to as a conventional mortgage, as, you know, um, conventional investment. And so we struggle in Rockford with a significant homeless population. Um, you know, we struggle with this east side versus west side philosophy, um, right? In Evanston, it's the north side versus the south side, right? In Rockford, we have this very beautiful river, beautiful, um, that cuts right in the middle of our community that separates the, you know, the haves to the, you know, from the have nots. And there has been a significant disinvestment in the west side over the years, um, and it, you know, I think that happens in many communities. Um, the closer we got to the interstate, the more commerce came on the east side. Um, you know, there are people who live on the west side that are like, we have a mall. I didn't even know there was a mall, right? Like, and then there are, you know, there are things and um, commercial buildings and opportunities on the east side that just aren't available, you know, to the families who live on the west side. And there's no reason for east side families to go to the west side. So it has become this kind of tale of two cities. Um, and for years now, we've been working to try to build the infrastructure on the west side. Um, we've closed a, a multitude of schools. We have food deserts. Like all of those kinds of things are happening on the west side that you would see happening in an urban community. And so there's been, you know, there's been significant investment uh, but it's just, it's not enough. The housing stock in Rockford and in communities across the states and, you know, across the, the state of Illinois and across the country is, is aging. We have both an aging stock and we have an aging population. And so that's a recipe for disaster uh, for many of our families who have been living generationally in their homes. Kimberly spoke of that kind of concept of generational families who've lived in Evanston in those houses since Evanston was created. We have that same issue in Rockford in that there are families who, you know, that's all they own, that's all they have, that's the only place they've ever lived, it's close to childcare, right? And so um, we have this kind of, this storm, this trifecta of stuff happening at the same time where the houses are just they're falling apart, they're aging, the population of people living within those houses are aging, and there's a significant disinvestment on the west side. And so we're able to see that bigger picture. Our city government is looking at that, several other nonprofits and government entities are saying, what are we doing? How are we gonna lift up the west side? You know, we are only as strong as our weakest, and so we need to ensure that everybody has that strength, everybody has that stability. And so there are a lot of initiatives happening as it relates specifically to, you know, commercial, like I don't, I don't have a lot to say about that, but you know, there's a lot of conversations about bringing in grocery stores and ensuring that there are, um, you know, um, public transportation and those kinds of things. As it relates to housing on the West side, we're doing two things, right? We do what we do. We build new houses and we rehab existing structures to, you know, sell those to families in our home ownership program. But what we've been able to launch over the last couple of years is what we refer to as a critical home repair program. Right. Um, Rockford Habitat aligns with Habitat International in that we understand that there is an opportunity for homeowners who currently live in their homes to, you know, help them with some of those renovations and some of those repairs that they might have that not have the financial resources to do. Many of them on fixed incomes, right? So um, Habitat International has a, you know, program called Aging in Place that is a portion of our critical home repair you know, that helps replace roofs and puts on wheelchair ramps and helps make bathrooms ADA compliant and, you know, those kinds of things. And so we've been able to leverage um, just this year alone, $500,000 in funding from the Rockford Housing Development Corporation and City of Rockford to do this home repair rehabilitation program that will help families who own their homes on the west side in some target neighborhoods and help them get their house in repair. 
to build that wealth, to you know, build that equity in their home, but to also ensure that they have a safe place to live the rest of their lives. So many people, that is, you know, that's that's their only choice. Is this is my family has owned this home for a hundred years, and this is where I will, you know, I will live out the rest of my days. And so for us, we're able to come in and kind of help with that. As it relates to partners, you know, Habitat is a really um, <laughs> collaborative organization. Um, at times that's a little bit of a, a curse, but most of the time it's a blessing. So we can't do anything on our own. Our success is only our success in that we work with teams of people from, you know, kind of every aspect of our community, even through the, you know, the process of ensuring that families know what our program is. You know, we attend Rockford Housing Authority's monthly orientation. So anytime someone moves into a public housing unit, in Rockford, they're introduced to Rockford Area Habitat for Humanity and been given a path to home ownership. Like this is what you have to do. And so starting in those kind of early stages of setting people up with just the idea that five years from now, you could own your own home. You could be living in public housing today and five years from now, you could own your own brand new house. Um, and so we are you know, consistently working with our community partners to ensure that everybody kind of knows who we are and what we do. As far as you know, it relates to construction, we're working with several school districts to teach the construction trade students the, the skill of construction by having them build houses for Habitat from the ground up. Once we get a family to a point where they're gonna purchase their home, we work with several entities to provide down payment assistance. I'll give you a quick example of this. Don't be mad or jealous that you did not receive these kinds of um, dollars when you closed on your home. But we built a house this year for a young woman who's a, a, a new teacher. She had transitioned from being a paraprofessional, received her bachelor's degree, and is now a teacher at Auburn High School. And we're working with her to have her purchase a house from Rockford Habitat. So she received a $20,000 down payment assistance grant from the Illinois Housing Development Authority. She received $14,999 worth of down payment assistance from the city of Rockford. 6,000 from the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago and 2,500 from Rockford Public Schools. They incentivize their employees to buy homes in Rockford and stay in Rockford, to not go out to other communities and, and, and purchase homes there. So they're incentivizing people by providing them down payment assistance. $45,000 worth of equity she received on closing day because she received these mortgages, these second mortgages from each of these down payment assistance grants. As long as she lives in her house for five years and doesn't sell her home, those loans are forgiven. So after five years, she will have all of that equity in her home. So in addition to having her first mortgage with Rockford Habitat, she has all of these you know, mortgages with, with different entities that provide down payment assistance. It makes a $125,000 house a $55,000 home to purchase. And so that immediately sets a family up for success. We could, I could talk for, you know, I've said this before, I could talk for days about the different people that we work with, but you know, we only have one and a half staff members on our construction team, which means everybody else is a volunteer. And so we rely on the backs of our community to come out and help us run our construction sites and, you know, um, work at our restore and help with our committees and serve on our board of directors. Um, and so we don't do any of this alone. We do this in collaboration every day. We're meeting with city government, we're meeting with county government, we're talking with legislators, we're talking with, you know, community partners, and even corporations and businesses, people who understand that the strength of our community, right, um, only gets better when we help the people who are struggling, and we ensure that everybody has a fair right, you know, to safe, affordable housing. It's such a fundamental right that it is easy for us to work in concert with so many different companies and organizations and, and people in our community to help us be successful. I think one of the things I'm most looking forward to is this idea of ensuring that we can provide these kind of critical home repairs through our aging in place program and ensure that you know, families have a safe place to, you know, um, you know, to spend the rest of their days, so.
Thank you so much, you know, Carrie. We're going to come back to some of your your future ideas. Um, Kimberly, I know that you're not going to be with Evanston too much longer, but what are yeah. you what do you see in the future for Evanston? You've made some great inroads. What are you most excited about for the future in Evanston, but then also where you're going? You're staying in the state of Illinois, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I appreciate the question, but I also want to be, I also want to be honest with you. I think we talk a lot about those individuals who are below the median income, and I know there's thresholds for people to qualify, but sometimes we forget about those people who are above who can't qualify. And I talk about that from my own personal experience. So. Being that I have been in local government my entire career, my parents own a home. I did live in a home. I do know that experience. But my entire adulthood, I have rented because I could not afford to put a down payment down because of my income level. Being a single person does not help either. And so, um, and so, you know, I almost. It's sad to say this, but at 40 years old, 40 years old, I'm now about to be a homeowner, not because of, you know, hard work, dedication, I put money towards it. It's kind of a necessity, really, um, now that I have to relocate out of the area. But being in the Chicagoland area, I had a colleague of mine say, I don't know if I need to ask for more money because I cannot afford anything near my job, and I'm going to have to continue to commute an hour and a half every day to get to work. So as we continue to talk about, you know, those who are below me, and we do want to, we do want to address those individuals. They do need to be a part of the conversation. I sometimes forget, I sometimes think we forget about those who are, who are, you know, technically <laughs> above that median income, but they are not able to own or invest. And what you're seeing is a lot of those are looking like me at my age, millennials who have been renters. And the moment in the story I will share is uh, I am going to be um, moving to Peoria to be the assistant city manager there. And when I was going through the process of rent, looking for a rental, housing is not very um, as expensive as, as it is living in the Chicago area. Uh, and so I thought it would be easy to find me a rental. It wasn't. It was very difficult um, because people are just not moving. They are not transitioning out of home. So my parents live in a big house. Of, uh, which was great when I was living there and others, but now for two people, they shouldn't be in that house. It should be going to the next generation of home buyers. But because it's so expensive for them to move at the age that they are near retirement or retired, they're stuck in their home that they really shouldn't be stuck in. And I say the same for myself. I have been stuck in renter uh, purgatory because I just could not afford a down payment because every down payment assistance program, I don't qualify because I don't have, I don't meet the income requirements. And so it took me leaving the area and going downstate to be able to buy a home and be able to afford it. But, I, you know, doing so, I have to take out my retirement to pay for a down payment. And I'm glad I have that. But now I'm taking from my future to pay for my, you know, day, but I know I'll make it up. I say all that because I, I think we just need to have a holistic conversation and what do we do about those people in the middle who are not able to go anywhere. And, and you're going to have a whole generation not in ownership, not building equity for their children, and we're going to be creating a cycle that's going to be going beyond the community of color. All communities, uh, especially the middle class community, are going to have this experience. And what are we doing about it? You know, that's the conversation, conversation you know, I'm trying to figure out. So I don't know that answered your question, but as to- uh, Yeah. Um, well, and I, for those yeah. of you who are interested, um, the United Way has done a lot in this area looking at asset limited rather than above or below a federal arbitrary poverty line. Um, so now we're looking at what was we would formally call the working poor. Um, now United Way has some really good classifications and those individuals tend to be above those minimum thresholds. And yet, um, they they have certain needs, whether it's housing or food, and those are the things that tend to get cut if if your uh, you know your income is at a certain level and you live in a certain area, and certainly that's the case in the Chicago land area for sure. So that's that's great. Thank you so yeah. much for bringing that up. No, I appreciate you know. And mind you, student loans are real. 
and unfortunately, the government does not allow you not to pay them back. <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and the credit union and the credit score bureaus do not allow you to not pay them. It it has a huge impact on your credit score. It has an impact on people's ability to move out of the, the current life that their current life um, housing. Uh, I have friends who have degrees and are professionals, and they will never be able to own a home just because of student loans. Yeah. And that's that's a really good discussion because I think we're still seeing movement on that issue at the federal level, and I think there's some things that, that are going to happen in the next few months to maybe help address that. Um, so we're at 1040, uh, 1247. I do want to open it up if there are folks who have questions for Carrie um, or Kimberly as we, we come up to one o'clock. I'd be happy to, to do that. So let me see if I can. I will. Um, if you want to let me know you, if you can. I'm going to go back to gallery view so I can see everybody. If you want to turn on your camera, raise your hand, I'll unmute you or let you unmute and then you can ask your question. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Anybody want to dive in? Don't be scared. <laughs> Chris, well, can I call you out? Oh, you got somebody? I was just going to say I was going to call out Chris Goodman because he's a faculty member in the MPA program who, is, who has studied a lot of local governments, particularly around uh, taxation and how that really influences um, housing in Illinois because we're at a very high property tax rate state. But he's not turning his camera on, which means maybe he doesn't want to. <laughs> maybe he doesn't want to chat. <laughs> Yeah, Marsha, let me get your, um, go ahead. You should be good to go to unmute now. Nobody's talking, so I thought I'd take advantage yeah, jump of in. Why not, Marcia? Of yeah. being there <laughs> and <laughs> talking about the West Side. I mean, I'm 70 now, but I, I went to school on the West Side, even though I was from Belvedere, because oh, okay. I went to Catholic school. I went to mm -hmm. Muldoon. And a lot of the people I went to school with lived there, but I think our whole school, we had two people of color. <laughs> and so since then, all those, you know, the white flight or whatever you want to say has happened so yeah. much in that area. Mm -hmm. And um, this idea of the food desert you know what the large grocery store decides to close and then part of the deal of selling the building is you can't put a grocery store in here because mm -hmm. yeah. it can't compete with us and then the, they say they're going to keep the hospital in the emergency room and then next thing you hear they're closing the hospital on the west side because they built a huge hospital on the east side by the tollway and it's so frustrating to me because I, I care about Rockford. I don't know personally what I can do about that, but is there an organization that, I know the mayor is fighting with the hospital about their plan. He but, sure is. <laughs> yeah. Is there a particular group that works on the food desert problem? Yeah, absolutely. So the local government, I think has a, a lot to do with that. Um, but the Region 1 Planning Council, R1PC, has been very instrumental in that. The Community Mental Health Board has been really instrumental in that. Transform Rockford has taken that kind of on as one of their initiatives as well. Um, you know, surveys were done a couple of years ago about where people buy milk and an overwhelmingly percent, high percentage of people on the West Side buy their milk at the stop and shop. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what's that's, available is fast that's food what's available. and little mm -hmm. tiny gas yep. station stores. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's and we a saw such situation. an incredible increase in the need for food assistance during mm -hmm. COVID. Um, that I mean, we were setting up drive-throughs in really commercial areas everywhere we could um, to ensure that so many of those families, you know, were receiving food assistance and responses we got from families our team took shifts in helping you know hand out boxes and you know kids were looking at oranges bags of oranges and and bunches of bananas and 
excited about the idea that they have fresh fruit in their house and they don't just have access to fresh food at fresh fruit at school. So, so I that think, was a multi-organizational yes. push. Yes, absolutely. They so we were contacted by you know the Northern Illinois Food Bank, um, you know, just as you know, volunteers if we were interested and willing in helping, you know, food distribution. And so we played a small role as an organization, but, um, you know, well, we it helped takes, staff at the takes all the centers. groups. Yeah. It takes everyone. Right. And so, um, we know kids don't learn well when they're hungry and we know no. that, you know, their health suffers and, you know, all of those things, it's really kind of a snowball effect. And so, right. uh, we recognize the importance of that, you know, kind of continuum. So, Okay. Thank you very much for the for the question, Marcia. And I think yeah. that's what we see is housing is so um, integrated into all of the other systems. It's not separate. Um, and the other thing that we're seeing, certainly in DeKalb, but other regions is um, when there isn't availability to uh, whether that's grocery stores or whatever, you end up paying more for those services, which mm -hmm. depletes your ability to move that money and do something else like put it into housing. <laughs> so it, it's very expensive to be poor. <laughs> Um, um, you can't, you don't have any of the benefits of buying things, say in bulk and going to Costco and your per right. unit costs go down because I, I worked when I was a student, I worked in this area and this one woman would come in and she'd buy a single roll of toilet paper every other day for say $2. And cause she would never have the money for $10 to buy a whole box. She would buy a single roll at a time. And I was like, God, like <laughs> I wanted to tell her, but this is how much money she had to spend that mm -hmm. day and so you're paying that premium when you're on a lower income and you don't really think about it for for most of us you you of course you're going to buy 10 rolls it's less than buying one at a time mm -hmm. but it's not available because you just don't have the resources um just just something to, you know, to throw I, in there i don't know kimberly if you want to jump in yeah yeah i just and, I, and i'm, I'm going to go in the territory that may be a little bit uncomfortable but i think it goes back to systematic racism it's called systems for a reason and all the systems that play, you know, the building of the highways that caused the disparity from the east and west side, when did that occur? You know, you know, because if you, if you, you know, being that I, I worked for uh, Rockford for a short period of time, I remember that being a conversation, understanding the history of why this one area was looking in a, in a you know, in a disrepair versus the other parts of Rockford that was thriving. And you start looking at, well, this highway wasn't always here. And you have to go through, and now you have to you just go around it. And so going around it because it's faster, but now you're bypassing the part of the community that thrive from the commercial aspect of having you go through it, you're now bypassing it, and you're, you're now segmenting them off. And I think we have to address systematic racism as part of our conversation, because if we don't talk about the systems, we are never going to really get to the root cause of how do we fix these issues. We're just going to keep putting Band-Aid on things, and that's going to eventually not going to be enough to actually fix the problem in, in, in the long run. Thank you. Um, Joanne asked the questions around rentals. Yeah. And Carrie, you can jump in, but she was asking specifically about rental units. Yeah, Joanne, that's a really great question. And I think something that, you know, communities across the state and the country are struggling with is this idea of concentration um, and, you know, large apartment complexes, you know, that popped up over the last, you know, 40 or 50 years where it concentrated lots and lots of families in a very small geographical area, um, you know, have um, contributed to this idea of, um, you know, uh, poor stock, poor, you know, um, poor physical stock in terms of apartments and not being able to keep up with that many units and landlords kind of, you know, letting properties go over time. Um, I think in terms of like, what, you know, what are some communities doing? Um, I do know that there's lots of conversations about there out there about um, and communities doing work of housing standards. And so your, all of your housing authorities across the United States who receive funding from HUD um, have to follow a certain housing standard, which 
I don't necessarily know is good enough yet, <laughs> uh, but at least it's a starting point, right, of ensuring that landlords, you know, have inspections and have to meet certain criteria. Um, there is definitely, you know, cities kind of and communities across the state taking on that as a municipality and ensuring that landlords are registering their rental properties and then being held to those standards. Um, I think a lot of it is, you know, education as it relates to landlords creating, you know, having honest dialogue with landlord associations and rental associations. That relationship has been so contentious in Rockford. Um, you know, I've had lots of conversations with the, um, the rental association and the realtors association and, you know, there's, you know, um, it's not always easy dialogue to have, but it's necessary to ensure that, you know, landlords are being educated about what, you know, their requirements are and what their um, standards should be. And so I think it really, um, <laughs> I think it comes down to a couple of like, um, really honest conversations about um, what standard would you agree to live in and how do you make that standard at, you know, a place that you're renting. And then I think just as municipalities, counties and city governments, they, they have a, a responsibility to our community to uphold those standards, to put those standards in place and then uphold them. It's not always the most popular conversation and the most popular thing to do. Um, but I think it's the ethical and the right thing to do in terms of cost controlling. There should be some, you know, things we put in place to ensure that, you know, landlords are, you know, giving notice at appropriate times and who are, you know, not increasing rent because of, you know, crime statistics and those kinds of things. So just my two cents, I, you know, I don't do, I don't do a lot of work with rentals. Be interested to hear what Kimberly had to say about that. Yeah, Kimberly, do you work with, with renters in Evanston or, or are there resources in Evanston that people can go as tenants to get information and what their rights are? Yeah, we work with open communities and so that's who we partner with with the city. So the city does not uh, directly, you know, we try not to at least. And I know there's sometimes emergency situations where we do support. Uh, we do have that. I think one of the... Um, Things that I hear a lot is about supporting those those landlords who are uh, family-owned units and making sure their upkeep and how we're getting them support uh, to do rehab and so forth to make sure that those that they're housed, who, if you think about it, the majority of those who are living in homes that are affordable are typically in homes that are, are, are owned by family-owned um, buildings such that have been in the home and they have these extra dwellings that they rent out. Um, you know, we're seeing a more private sector coming in into the uh, housing market and driving up the cost for housing. And so that's really difficult when you start talking about working with landlords because you can't work with someone who's out of New Jersey or out of the country. And so, um, you know, trying to bring home ownership back locally and, and getting people able to own those dwellings is something that would be beneficial. That's why we are looking at ADUs. And ADUs is another opportunity in Evanston where we are addressing that need to bring in housing where we can build housing capacity without building housing um, by looking at one's um, garage or there may be an extra unit somewhere in the home where they can modify to make it a unit. Uh, so trying to find spaces that are already currently there that can be occupied by someone that may be in affordable at that same point. And so these are things that we are looking at and addressing. It's, it's political as always. Like I said, there are certain places in town where they're not as much favorable because we are a community that has a university. And so we have controversial rules like three unrelated. Well, three unrelated may not sound bad to someone like you or I, but for some community members, they see that as housing as many university students as possible in a house that used to be a single family home. So how can we change that stigma and deal with that, but at the same time be able to allow someone to house more people uh, who are families who are maybe not the traditional families, but you know they have the space to allow for additional housing. And that's something that we're, we're
working on and dealing with currently in the city. So Cohen, you had a question or a comment? No, and, and I, I apologize for being late. Um, just had was pulled in, in some other direction for a little while, but I, I was really looking forward to being able to attend this. Um, but uh, on the topic of affordable housing, well, a couple things. There, there's a lot in this topic for sure. Um, but, you know, holding landlords accountable um, in the city of DeKalb, that's been a, a challenge for us in, in the past. And we've aggressively gone after one particular landlord um, and recently just made a, a a major incentive, a million dollar incentive to a, a another developer to be able to come in and purchase 403 of those units, who's going to be a responsible developer and be able to provide, you know, a place, a quality place, a safe place for people to be able to live compared to um, the previous uh, owner. Um, and boy, I, I, I want to use a lot of adjectives there, but, but, but I won't. Um, but it, but it's it's a long play for city government to be able to hold landlords accountable, and uh, that was something I would encourage everyone on this call. That uh, you know, recently I was in a conversation with the DeKalb County government because there's another large apartment complex of 535 units called suburban apartments and estates in our area, which is uh, another landlord basically forcing people to live in squalor. Um, it, it's just it, it's just horrible. But the county um, is is they're 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 starting conversations, but they're reluctant uh, to enforce uh, or even make modifications to uh, the laws that are on the books to be able to hold someone like that accountable because of the politics of we're a rural community and those same rules would apply to a, a larger a larger group. Um, and rather than entering dialogue and really trying to pursue it, you get uh, you get. Uh, roadblocks brought up. So uh, it's going to take all of us to really be able to encourage our elected officials to, to show leadership and show courage uh, to be able to go after uh, these landlords. And you know what, if we need to make modifications to existing laws, if we need to step on some toes, if we need to enter into a, an area that, that could uh, cause political backlash, that's okay, because it's about what's right. Um, and we need to be advocating for that more and more. Um, and I think that voice is getting louder and louder, which is great. On affordable housing, though, I also I, I, I got to call out um, a lot of times we we all forget we want to we want we talk about affordable housing, we talk about landlords and we put landlords in a bucket um, that, you know, they want to make money, they want to X, Y or Z. But I think one thing, a component we forget about affordable housing is taxation, um, property taxes, especially when we look at the city of DeKalb, we're two percent higher than any community in our surrounding area. So when you look at how property taxes are broke up across um, like a, a city, we take 10% of, of every 10 cents of every dollar of your property taxes, right? A school district takes 60 to 70 cents of every dollar. So one thing to pay attention to, especially in the city of DeKalb is we've had a lot of increased EAV because we've had a lot of increased economic development that so many of us have been working hard to, to be able to bring in. And that brings opportunity, jobs, right? That, that, just, that can be a real game changer. But if we don't associate property taxes with a component of affordable housing, those government entities are going to continue to consume those additional dollars. And all what that means is good landlords don't have the dollars to be able to reinvest in that property, um, whether it's upkeep, whether it's safety, um, you name it. Good, hardworking people, the working poor, right, can't afford to buy that house in DeKalb because the property tax burden far exceeds, in, in many cases, what the mortgage may even be. So, so what in the city of DeKalb, we have for multiple years now, and this last year, we actually put money back into the taxpayer's pocket. And what I'm encouraging those on the call that have a voice in the city of DeKalb, um, every government entity in the city of DeKalb is benefiting by all the increased AAV that we have. And they'll either consume it or they'll give a portion of it back. And the more we give back to the taxpayer, it means the more we lower the tax rate, which means the more we make it affordable to live in our community. Um, so that's a component that I just didn't want to get lost yeah. or overlooked maybe in this conversation, that yeah. uh, uh, taxing bodies across the board, even when it's all about the children, have a responsibility to the taxpayer to really be able to uh, make an impact on affordable housing. I'm done. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Cohen. Thank you. Last thoughts, because we are 106, so we're over, <laughs> which is normal for, for such an amazing topic. And I appreciate both of our participants sharing their expertise, their backgrounds, their experience. I, I wish, Kimberly, you well in your new yeah, home and fun. location, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, I know you'll, I know you do well, no matter what Carrie, same thing. You and I are going to cross paths lots of times, yep. but um, I really appreciate you coming on today. Yeah. 
thanks so much for inviting oh. us. This is a important conversation, no matter where you live, no matter who you are, no matter what your role is in our society, um, everyone should be talking about housing. So thanks for, thanks for bringing this to the forefront. Kimberly, you wanted to say something before we leave? Yes, just real quickly. Even though I'm departing, I see on the call, like I say, um, Sarah Flax, who is like our wizard when it comes to housing. And I mean, she is the, the person I go to for everything housing related. I, I mean, reach out. I think you all will have a great conversation and how we can continue this discussion. Uh, she's just, to me, is who I go to and um, will continue to go to even as I leave or depart the city. So um, I just want to shout out Sarah. I see she's on the call. She's just a great asset and a wonderful colleague and just knows to run circles around me any day when it comes to housing. And I love it. Uh, I just sit there and watch. Uh, anyway, but thank you for, uh, it's an honor for me to be a part of this discussion today. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.